So finally, um, I'd like to introduce Scott Hale, who's a faculty, fe faculty fellow of the Alan Turing Institute and senior data scientist at the Oxford in Internet Institute. Um, Scott is going to give a similar overview from a different perspective on the same UK web um, space from 1996 to 2013, but from a social science perspective. So I'd like to welcome Scott onto the stage, please. Great, it's wonderful to be here. I'm realized that I'm the last slot, I'm the last thing between you and the end of a long day, but uh, bear with me very quickly for, for 10 minutes. I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, you know, how I think uh, data science and web archiving can come together, some of the uh, things that we can do from that. Uh, my background is both computer science and social sciences, so I'm coming at this um, from a slightly different perspective than, than as Jane did earlier. Uh, thinking more about this as a large scale uh, perspective. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, two ways that we've interrogated the archive uh, in some past research and then reflect uh, in closing on a few ways uh, where data science I think can, uh, can infuse the whole process right from the web archiving straight through to the research side. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the first one, um, we started on this a couple of years ago and we were looking for something that we could analyze within the archive. We started looking at universities because they were something wholly contained uh, within the UK web space. Um, and we wanted to do this in a longitudinal way because that's something that's often missing in a lot of social science work at the moment is it's easy to, to go off, crawl something, see the web as it is now. But what about putting that in context and seeing how it's changing over time? And working with social science colleagues, then we wanted to understand uh, the extent to which some of the online data was either reproducing or where it was uh, conflicting with some of the traditional uh, measures offline. And uh, so we started with the UK uh, uh, web domain data set that's housed here at the British Library, but was originally acquired uh, by the Internet Archive and all of their partner organizations, uh, and pared that down uh, in looking at the temporal hyperlinks between sites. So unlike Jane's team digging into the actual text, uh, we let that aside, and we were more interested in this sort of emergent structure of how all the pages uh, that are in this archive are linked together and what that looks like. And uh, in terms of, we looked at a number of contexts, but uh, in terms of the academic side, we grouped them down together in the, the host graph uh, on a yearly basis. So we had something like this. We could say, oh, Oxford linked to Cambridge X number of times in, in each year. And then we looked to compare this to a number of different proxies. So we looked and said, well, there's some affiliations of, of universities like the Russell Group or the 1994 Group. And, those were mixed, they weren't really represented um, within this network. But one thing that, uh, that was, was league table rankings. We took these out of the times, and uh, it's 2000, 2005, and 2010. And each group is, is a series of different measures uh, that are looking at what is the most central university in terms of this hyperlink network, right? And so what's, what university is sitting in the most central? And we can see over time, actually, that uh, the rankings and the centrality measures are coming uh, closer and closer together, becoming more correlated. And uh, on the right side is a, a graph uh, of the most correlated measure here. And uh, so that was one measure that we were looking at, saying, oh, well, actually this hyperlink structure online, which is sort of decentralized, all these universities are making their own decisions, and, and in ca many cases, many different people at different universities making decisions on what to link to, and yet we're sort of seeing a, a resurgence of a traditional um, measure that is, is already used for, for good or ill. There are certainly many uh, issues with, with university rankings. Uh, but nonetheless, we're seeing that reproduced uh, in this data. If we look at another dimension, we looked at the geography and considering the physical distance between universities and how they linked uh, to each other. Again, the same three years. And across all three years, um, we actually see a, still a very strong uh, reproduce, reproduction of geography that universities that are closer together are more likely to link to each other than universities further apart. And although this has been observed in other contexts, such as uh, scholarly publications or citations, um, which are even more strongly related to, to geography, uh, this was sort of a first look at uh, the web linking practices, which you might have thought you could have been a bit more open in that it, there's less investment. In collaboration, okay, you might have to physically uh, come together at various points and, and such, uh, but even web linking uh, practices between the universities were very dependent 
on geography. So these were some of our first looks at, at universities as a place to start, um, seeing some of these uh, affiliations, some of these other measures sort of reproduced and, and noting that physical distance was still important. But there's a number of limitations that have been touched on throughout the day, uh, one of which is completeness, just what is in this archive and what's missing. Um, variable timings that capture some of these websites are crawled quite frequently, others quite infrequently. Uh, times of year, early in the year, late in the year, right? And then not really an issue for the academic um, subdomain, but for other instances, what are the effects of this sort of boundary, at least within the JISC Internet Archive data, uh, that boundary is in the, the .uk uh, perspective. And so uh, digging a bit more at that first spot, um, we went off to look at, understand how much of a website was um, archived, and we focused in on, on one website in particular, and that was TripAdvisor. Uh, not simply because it was the most interesting, but because it was a well-known site, uh, but also that we knew when new attractions, when new tourist attractions were added to TripAdvisor, we could sort of estimate that based on when the earliest review of those websites were. And, uh, and so we were able to sort of tap into what had been an open question about how much of any one website is archived um, on the data. Uh, sorry, within the archives. And you know, it's immediately clear from the top is the archive data, uh, the bottom, the, the web arc, uh, the live data. We ran our own crawler to, to get that data. And it's immediately clear that there's less data uh, in the archive than the live web. Um, it's about a quarter, it's about 25%. Um, and you know, there's sort of some different temporal patterns. Now, 25% isn't bad, right? I mean, if I can ask a quarter of the US population how they're gonna to vote tomorrow, I'd be pretty confident in, in the result, right? I mean, any pollster would love to have that. Well, at least if we're a representative of the population. And that's the question. What is what is archived representative of the broader uh, population? And within the TripAdvisor case that we are looking at, um, one way we could compare those is by looking at the number of reviews that tourist attractions had. And here, note that on the live site, uh, there are significantly fewer reviews uh, on each attraction on average than in the archived uh, web pages, i.e. the archived has this bias towards uh, prominent, well-linked, well-known uh, sites. And so it's not a representative sample. It's not a probabil probabilistic sample. And so this affects the way that uh, we're going to analyze that and what we need to do. Of course, historians um, are used to digging into an incomplete record, uh, but this is now bringing it to a new scale. And so we need new tools, new methods to deal with this and understand. And this is where I think, um, just in closing in the couple minutes I have left, um, thinking about where data science can, can fit in and some of the, um, the possibilities from both web archiving uh, all the way through to sort of opening up the data and making it more useful. So one thing to note, of course, is that I've been talking about the Internet Archive data um, and what should have been clear from, from Jane's numbers already in, in the 2014 data. Uh, it's larger not only because the web is growing, but also because different methods are being used and the BL running its own crawls is a more targeted uh, approach. They're able to start with uh, a seed list of all the domains in .uk, for instance. Um, and they can also uh, go a bit beyond that. The le legal deposit legislation allows them to crawl any British website, so something like theguardian.com, uh, clearly should be, be crawled, and um, the web archiving team has already done a lot of great work in, in sort of coming up with listing those sites and finding them out. But, of course, it's easy to find the prominent ones we might think of, uh, but there's a long tail, I suspect, of sites that are British, uh, but not in .uk, and we may not know about them instantly. And this is a, an area where I um, excited in terms of thinking about where data science can contribute, is thinking about methods to both discover uh, possible candidates and thinking this might be a British site based on the hyperlink structures or um, what is there, this is a candidate we'll want to evaluate, and then actually moving through to machine learning and, and classification to evaluate that site in an automated manner and say, oh yeah, well, we can give this a score about how confident we are this is a British website or not, and therefore whether or not it should be crawled, thinking beyond the, the .uk subdomain, which is, is an easy sort of boundary, but uh, may not be the most uh, complete boundary, so thinking beyond that. 
And then can we use data science in other ways in terms of uh, crawling some of the individual sites in page discovery or dealing with personalization um, and incomplete uh, websites? Can we also maybe think about creating more metadata on what is not crawled, right? And thinking about uh, documenting the ways that uh, it is incomplete if we can, can deduce that in a reasonable manner. Shifting over to the social science research side of this, um, it's clear that we have to become much better at dealing with missing and biased data and that the, the sort of just straight inferential statistics is not going to take us uh, where we need to go. So thinking about appropriate null models to use in, that, uh, in those tasks. And then uh, working on some of the making more uh, richer and, and more accessible uh, metadata available uh, very much in, in line with, uh, as Jane and Blakenji were saying, right, is, is opening up this data so that uh, people with a variety of skill sets can make use of it. And I think this is a real opportunity for the expertise um, of the Alan Turing Institute, along with working with the British Library in partnership, is to uh, enrich the data that can be made available more generally uh, for the whole of, of research. So thank you very much for the time. Really look forward to it. Thank you.